Hey, I'm your host, George Payne, and welcome to Build Up Africa, a podcast brought to you by Adiverse in which we explore the rapidly developing African tech landscape with a focus on Web3, entrepreneurship, and investing. You can listen to Build Up Africa on YouTube, Medium, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Today's episode is all about the importance of understanding African consumer behavior and the challenges businesses face in gathering valuable data and insights on this critical market. As we all know, Africa is a diverse continent with unique cultures, traditions, and consumer behaviors. However, due to a lack of comprehensive data and insights, businesses and investors have historically struggled to understand the African consumer. This lack of knowledge and understanding has led to many missed opportunities and inefficiencies in the African market. But solutions are emerging that help bridge this gap on today's episode, we'll be speaking with Kemdi Ebi, CEO of Versus Africa, a platform that connects businesses with African consumers and efficiently gathers valuable data and insights on their behavior. Kemdi has an extensive background in consumer insights and has worked with some of the world's leading brands to gain a better understanding of African consumers. He'll be sharing with us his insights on why understanding consumer behavior is crucial for businesses looking to succeed on the continent and how Versus Africa is addressing this challenge. Moreover, we'll be discussing how blockchain technology can be leveraged to build a more secure and transparent data ecosystem that benefits both consumers and businesses. The technology has the potential to revolutionize the way we collect and manage data, ensuring that consumer privacy is protected while providing businesses with the insights they need to make informed decisions. Hello, my name is Kem Diebi. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Versus Africa. Versus Africa is solving a very major problem of the lack of quality data on the African consumer market. Africa is about 1.2 billion people large. And the more you go into consumer data, it's so much harder. And regions, complexities with language, so on and so forth, is really difficult to come across. So we are solving that major problem by offering brands speedy, accurate, and very just uh, flexible access to this data. What's a use case of Versus and companies trying to access that consumer insight? There are several. So we've had so many companies and brands from different industries. So I can give you one example. A consumer goods brand wants to find out what their opportunity is within the Gen Z market in a certain region in Africa. They've come to us and they have a hypothesis. And with that hypothesis, they want to be able to either conclude, which is accept or dispel uh, whatever their hypothesis is. So uh, through our market research technology, we're able to A, collect this data from the relevant Gen Z population within their sample. And of course, depending on their budget, uh, we're able to then help them to get this data. And then of course, deliver the reporting that they require. So it's really just, again, that's just on one industry consumer good company. We also have another really great one where crypto betting company wanting to actually look at opportunities to be present in Nigeria reached out to us and were able to help them identify crypto users as well as betters and even some actual crypto betters and then got them in a room and were able to still uh, again utilizing our research technology uh, we're able to recruit the right profiles they were looking for to, again, help them as well in their conclusion of their hypothesis. So the platform is effectively enabling people to access Africa better as well as scale products within there because of the data they can gather on their prospective consumers um, for their products. Absolutely, yes. When it comes to the application of crypto as well, I think this is a unique thing that you're positioning here because it's not, it, you're going about gathering this data and actually creating the ecosystem in which you can collect this information in a different way than has been explored in other models. Can you speak to more about the way in which you're incorporating blockchain in your model? Oh yeah, definitely. So, so first off, the actual collection of the information we're getting is from the end consumers. So we're looking at focusing on consumer insights. That's our focus. That's very relevant to us and of course the brands who want this information from us. Because of the flexibility uh, with the technology tool and how they can ask questions, for instance, to 100, 200, 500, however many people across a certain region, for us, speed and accuracy are important. And so we actually are very big on rewarding appropriately. But that reward also comes with our end scouts we call them scouts so scouts can either be respondents to surveys or they can actually be working as agents for us to actually go and fulfill tasks on behalf of the brand so these scouts slash respondents are rewarded by either cash and now we want to give them crypto why because crypto rewards actually ended up pulling very high in our 
in our own research, asking them how they would like to actually be uh, rewarded. A lot of them were very much uh, in unison saying that they would prefer crypto rewards. And so it was inevitable that we would have to look into essentially um, having our clients and brands buying into our potential tokens, which we will then distribute as far as our business model is right now with these scouts that would be helping them to get certain information so they can actually earn from a fraction of what they pay us. Is there a particular kind of client that's coming to you to access Africa? Are they more sort of younger generation focus, generation Z, yes. millennial focus as opposed to more traditional? Yes, and we're seeing a lot of, uh, so first off, again, we've seen, we're quite agnostic in our sort of lineup of companies or brands have reached out to us. We've had banks, telecommunication companies, again, sports, crypto, gaming, what else? Uh, we've also had consumer goods. Uh, we, so we've had the whole lot, right? Restaurants, now uh, consulting groups, research agencies, also advertising marketing agencies. So we've had the whole lot. And um, what we've seen is consistent is that a lot of them are looking at expanding opportunities already existing because they already have businesses and investments within the continent. So what they want to do is either uh, ensure that going into a certain new investment, new product or expansion of a existing product or idea, you know, they make sure that they have the right information in front of them. So uh, it doesn't really like, I guess it's not really segmented in that sense. So we've seen people who are more, let's say, interested in Gen Z information. We've seen people who are more interested in millennial information. Uh, we've seen people who are just interested in general population information, right? Um, we've also seen people who are interested in product ideation, sort of responses slash analysis. We've seen people who are more interested in just getting sentiment as well about competitors, uh, what competitors are doing better than them or vice versa. So it's, it's the, all the, the use cases have really spanned, but what we've always strived to do as a company is ensure that the technology tool itself it's is flexible and adaptable to these many use cases because like we pointed out in the beginning the problem is there's actually just a lack of quality data right some of the data is there but it's scattered it's it's just not very useful and uh, use user user friendly for lack of better words to be able to actually say i can beat my chest and say this is actually what my product is going to do when i launch it in this part of africa so what we want to do is actually continue to strive to be that go-to for that flexible way of getting information at scale. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. You touched upon there the lack of data, and it's quite a distinct lack of data in Africa up until this point. We've seen it in gaming, we've seen it in FinTech. There's, for a whole host of reasons, lack of infrastructure, lack of digital infrastructure. Is this part of a broader play as well to aggregate data, to provide just cleaner data sets and better best practices for businesses going forward so that there is, you know, much more availability, clearer economic opportunity for businesses to move into Africa. Um, yes, I think for us, what's because as we collect this data, we're very open with our brands that we work with because um, our focus is uh, collecting consumer data, right? Uh, consumer data means uh, on ag you're aggregating certain information from a certain sample of well, whether it's, um, again, crypto betters, SME merchants, whether it's end consumers of, you know, beverages, you know, so many things, right? And uh, there's certain information, like even sports lovers, people who are watching football, people who watch the Premier League versus the La Liga. So eventually what I see us doing definitely would be another source of very important data that, you know, again, you know, whether it's economic outlooks, whether it's... Uh, from a more sort of macro perspective, people could actually access and really get some very good, um, useful information. And again, because of the vastness and the, you know, just the different, the diversity for lack of better words and dynamism of the kinds of information we get from end consumers on aggregate, I think we're just another really important sort of node to the overall sort of data collection industry that's budding in, in, in the continent. Uh, I see some players in the market, and again, everyone's doing one thing in their way. Uh, we've chosen this way, particularly because we've, um, our collective experience 
um, gives us the confidence that we can do it well and of course scale it such that we can bring in you know massive massive global opportunities across the board just even where and this is just on the side we're currently about to put out a public report and this public report is actually focusing on the impact of the russia ukraine war in africa right now a lot of people probably are just blind or don't even have an idea of how certain consumers have been affected on the on the African continent. It's just fact, right? I mean, there's probably murmurs and maybe just ideas, but solid sort of information that shows the direct impact to livelihoods. And so our tool allows us to actually go out there and survey and ask people, you know, what exactly have you seen has been the impact in your, you know, sort of situation? And what we've done is we've also collected like general economic information that we also get through you know, because we also have a listening uh, element where we can get online information relevant to Africa and we can dissect that as well as also direct information from the consumers through our scout network. So we basically get this report together and add all this really dynamic information that shows and, and educates people, especially who might be interested in opportunities to expand their, um, you know, their business, their investments, and really have a really clear idea of what the a, the opportunities are, and of course, some of the existing issues as well. So for instance, one of the things that we've actually highlighted from that report is that the end consumer actually is looking for more access to like, you know, uh, local consumption of rice and oils, right? Grains. And we already know that Ukraine is one of the biggest, largest exporters of, of those uh, goods. So that already opens up opportunities to see where other export, or in this case, if they're exporters who might want to import and do business in the countries relevant, whether it's Nigeria or Kenya, they can actually start to see about putting all of that together. Adversely, we also looked at how opportunities also within Africa, where we have businessmen, entrepreneurs like Aliko Dangote, who just launched a fertilizer plant and also is about to launch an oil refinery. Literally, these are two major like economic global economic like opportunities where Nigeria being the uh, where his resident or where he's resident is going to be exporting this in the absence of Russia and Ukraine, uh, who are primarily large exporters of the, uh, the the products that bring out whether it's the fertilizer side Ukraine and then on the oil side Russia. They are one of the biggest in refining oil across the world, refining oil and sharing that the refined oil across the world. So yeah, anyways, but the point I'm making is um, we are trying to also make sure that we stick to what we do best um, in that consumer insights sort of lane and be a big, big sort of inclusive part, play a big inclusive part in that general data collection industry. It definitely seems to be that more people around the world, more businesses are taking note of Africa as a serious market. And the war in Ukraine has definitely highlighted the importance of it, especially when it comes to sanctions, well, who's obeying them, who's actually aligning with that or continuing to, to import cheaper oil and stuff. And I think that that's really something that is going to be something in the next few years. People are really starting to consider African markets as genuinely massive. As if you look at the every, every week, I'm talking to people about, you know, it, it makes sense to really take note of what's happening in Africa. Average age is 19. Okay. Hungry young population that entrepreneurs that are building stuff statistically they're going to continue buying things that need to be imported and will be exported and i think understanding that and bringing light to it is super important and i think that but, but i think that oftentimes a lot of people consider africa as there's sort of two channels one is i'm not going to go into africa or attempt to because it's so difficult it's just some big region that i don't know about I've been propagandized that it's mud huts and slums and I, I don't know it. It's not a big market. I'm going to ignore it. Or the route is, okay, I'm just going to use the exact same tooling that I've used to collect data in the U S and Europe, you know, Asia, and then apply it. But you guys do it very differently. You have much more of an iPhone. You, know, you, you've built the system to be localized, to kind of have that much more nuanced approach to data collection in Africa what are you guys doing in terms of that? Because I know there's several different programs and initiatives that you have built into Versus to have that much more 
intuitive understanding of Africa. No, thank you so much, George. And you're spot on. You know, it's almost like uh, there's this quote that my, uh, a very good friend of mine always says is that in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king, right? And that quote resonates with me because even we look at ourselves as, I mean, of course, in this case, thankfully we got two eyes and we can lead, you know, people accordingly, but you know, uh, and the idea is that we, we're going to keep getting better and better in making sure that visually when people are looking to come into this continent and opportunities there, they can always trust us as their guide. And so accordingly, when building tools, and in this case, when holding that flashlight to go through what might be this maze of opportunities in a continent that's so complex like Africa, it's only right that you build it according to what you know are hindrances to collecting and getting this information without issues. So for instance, one of the things that we've incorporated into our suite of services within our market research technology tool is a way to listen in on conversations with a bit more nuance. So we can actually understand African local language where it's, whether it's uh, Pidgin English, Yoruba, Swahili, going also into French, a lot of these languages that are spoken by, you know, millions of Africans, even online, but may not be easily and well translated for maybe just quick sentiment gathering to be able to know where, for instance, there's a huge spike in negative mentions within a certain demographic group speaking online about them, uh, or a, a huge spike in positive, you know, sentiment that might be very relevant to their brand or even to some degree what their competitors are talking about. And a lot of the other tools that are out there are not really built in that same way because the languages are not really as focused on because it's not really their immediate focus, right? So what we want to do is also give brands that access to actually really getting that information faster and being able to filter through and say, oh, I see that in the day, you know, I have 30 days in January. From the 15th to the 20th, I noticed a spike in negative mentions and they're all in Swahili language. And it's obviously understanding that this is actually bad and I need to respond to it. So that's just one example. And of course, because we have a scout network that's going to be expanding across the different sort of major consumer markets from Nigeria to Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, South Africa, and even, you know, like, and, and eventually we'll go into the, the, you know, the Northern part. The idea is that we want to make sure, and Francophone countries included, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, in every place that brands are trying to go, we are that guide with the right sort of flashlight to share, you know, to give, to, to guide them through how to actually plant their seeds and where to plant them so that they actually get the, the right yield they're looking for. So again, building the tool in a certain way as well was very important and still is because we learned so much in the process and we actually like purposely talk to our clients or customers to actually get them to tell us more so that we can actually incorporate some of our learnings from them to continue to build, which is why it was very key for us to not take a, a, another product and just license it out to, to make money. For us, it's beyond that. It's actually about building something to continue to fine tune and scale and actually help people to really include Africa in, in, the, in the global sort of like uh, landscape of opportunities and being another sort of access to ensuring that we don't get into a recession, right? Because again, if the opportunity comes through where we are able to see where other African countries can come in and maybe fill in the gaps for a certain, you know, major exports that might not be available because of the war, for instance, that's where a lot of these things can come up, right? Like, and just looking at other things that might be more relevant to actual private companies and brands. One of the programs you have is the Scout system and obtaining data and insight from broad selection of African citizens. How does that process work? You have a reward system to get that information from people. What does that system work like for consumers that are offering that insight? And what does that data then look like for the clients receiving that? And how do they make that actionable? Yeah, great question. So we have very easy way, because again, we're leveraging technology. So we've built actual apps where our scouts themselves can go in and, and, and join the program. And we can actually track the quality of their responses and ensure that they're doing things right. So we don't blacklist them again, 
it's a reward system, but it's a community first. The community says, you know, scouts honor, be honest, and then earn, right? And that's really just a simple way that we put it for people so that they know that their time is worth it, but we're also looking at quality first. Yeah, so okay. basically we, we we have the mechanism, which again is from the app and then we, which would allow for any other user across the continent, just simply go in and be a scout. But for, for us, that's you that's like a one-to-one -one communication line where people can get tasks get uh relevant um surveys that actually match their demographic that brands are looking for answer them earn credits and then they can do everything within that environment so if they reach a certain minimum they can cash out in uh, again their local currency or now what we're trying to do is also give them the crypto reward um element but what we also are really promoting is engagement in active research to make the continent better. So we actually are very conscious in making sure that these scouts understand their real task. And in fact, their real mission, which is really about being sort of the gatekeepers to quality in Africa, like ensuring that brands do what they say they're going to do, whether it's through providing a product or service so that they know that, you know, um, it's an empowerment tool if you think about it, right? Because you don't really hear about in most African private sector sort of like environments, businesses have this overwhelming power over consumers. Consumers don't really have a voice. And even when things go bad, like a bank doesn't, for instance, reverse a, a failed transaction back to your bank account when you've been debited and you know, you, you're complaining. The only other way you can do that is going to Twitter. But even then, like you don't, you're not guaranteed a quick response. But again, what we are doing is making sure that we're not allowing them feel like their voices are not important. So the bigger, bigger sort of effect that it has from a longer term perspective is going to really help to, again, empower the consumer that is going to also be very uh, important and inclusive in building the global economy at large. So, so again, that information, going back to the way it works. So when they answer questions uh, that match their demographic or fulfill tasks, all of those things are like, again, happening in, in, in a common environment where they can look at it, they can review, you know, um, how much they have as far as credits, and then they can again uh, cash out when they reach their minimum. So it's a really, really just simple, efficient way that people stay accountable, uh, people stay um, active. It's also kind of like gaming kind of thing as well. There's a gamification element to it because people want to get surveys before their friends. People want to know how much people have earned. People also want to know like what kind of questions that they got. And so we've gotten some people who've also shyly said, oh, I, I heard, you know, someone who I know in my network got a survey that was about this and that. I didn't get it. And we're like, oh, you know, that's not because we didn't like you or anything. It's because the brand chose their demographic, whatever their demographic was. So uh, so you can see people are really excited and always looking forward to um, being a part. So yeah, so it's really exciting and the future looks bright. So Versus has actually been up and running for a little bit. A lot of data been collected. Is there any interesting insight that came out as a surprise was something that you didn't first envision being the case? Is there any kind of weird or strange things that have come up from the investigations that you've conducted? Yeah, it's it's actually very interesting uh, you said that. There's quite a few that have come up, actually. There's quite a few. And obviously, I wouldn't mention anything that is relating to any of the brands we've worked with. But I think from a general perspective of I think first off, I think what is really, what was one thing that is very clear is that a lot of people outside of what people think have access to smartphones. That's the first thing, right? Like there's this, there's still this like very overwhelming perception that the average sort of uh, African in a rural, rural community that's not in the city or urban community is using a feature phone. And that is actually not so true. And also they are very conversant with social media and all the things that happens. And yeah, so one of the things we found out from a very, very sort of extensive research we did specifically in Nigeria, where we kind of started everything we're doing is that, you know, a very, very large percentage of folks in, in Nigeria are uh, heavily relying on information from Twitter. That's not to say that it's not like something people may have already sort of figured out, but 
I think the overwhelming uh, response around social political issues and where people source information, I think that was where it was very, very glaring that the, the, the average, or in this case, the you know general population sample that we took, do not trust other sources that, and we gave them options like TV, radio, uh, gave them other options like newspapers, and but they Twitter is their source of truth. So that also says a lot when you think about the outage that you know I think it was uh, two years ago or so when there was that one time when. Uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, I think, went out or something like that. So, again, but these are all very, like, important, relevant things. And then when we look further into the demographic of responses and the people that actually answered that, it was also really interesting to see, even in these rural areas, typical rural areas, people were overwhelmingly, like, looking at Twitter as their primary source of information. So that was one very interesting fact, to be honest. And I think just because we're also in like political season um, in major markets, especially Nigeria, for instance, having their elections next month, like these are very sort of like important things that people want, want to know. And uh, we kind of also have a cue into what the popular vote is as well, but we will go there. Yeah. What blockers do you foresee there being in the adoption of certain data infrastructural practices? in Africa? I think the major thing would be, so there's still, there's still this overwhelming perception. And again, I don't think it's, it's no one's fault, but I think it's just because it's still very early in our industry, but there's this overwhelming perception from especially local businesses that rely on like primarily Western data to make decisions before actually looking at their native like source. And like I said, I think that is also as a result of like maybe just trust gaps, you know, which is something that is, you know, prevalent in a lot of third world countries where just there's corruption and all kinds of things that happens. But uh, when even all the relevant evidence data and uh, validations or, or credentials are shared, there's still this apprehension. So I think it's about, you know, make, making sure that trust gap closes a lot more. And we're starting to do that. And thankfully, I think people are starting to see that this is actually the way uh, forward in terms of getting more hyper-local uh, access. But yeah, it's just to continue to see about that. And we're even like partnering with a lot of um, traditional, like well-known Western research agencies, marketing agencies to help them get hyper-local research for their customers who are looking at this for uh, certain parts of the continent. So, so I think it's just really closing that, that perception there. I think just that idea that the local option is not available because there's this idea that it's just never been there. So we just have to rely on whatever we get from outside of it. So it's just the same way you have to look at your immediate sort of environment to trust what happens around there before looking so much further away. Because again, the same source of where the information they're getting uh, from come to us eventually and ask for the same hyperlocal data, so yeah. Because I think that's a, there's a consistency there in Africa with a bias toward international brands and products. So I think it makes sense that that carries through to the preferences around data. So what do you think, high level, what does the evolution of data and data infrastructure in Africa look like in a way that helps brands understand consumers and maybe a bit of business and the economy generally? Where do you see the market going? So I think because obviously this, this may sound biased, but it's, uh, it's just because we're seeing it directly and we're also in the mix. But exactly what we're doing and what other contemporaries are doing as well, uh, folks in the space, I feel like people are starting to realize because until one or two, three, four people act and begin to show value and to show that this is actually what it's, how to really collect this type of data and this is what you can get from it. That's only when people can start to trust more. So the actions are very important from the right solution providers, which I think, thankfully, we, we also fit the bill in that regard. So um, we just have to continue to act. We just have to continue to add that value. And the future is why we're doing what we're doing. That future being that um, we, we, you know, we're providing hyperlocal research uh, data in this case at scale 
so that brands can actually navigate better, both local and even global brands operating within the continent. Everyone needs it. Everyone. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Build Up Africa. If you'd like to learn more about Adiverse, please head over to adiverse.co. If you'd like to pitch for investment, please email a copy of your pitch deck, as well as an overview of your company to pitch at adiverse.co. You can listen to Build Up Africa on YouTube, Medium, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. See you guys next time.